as we were singing it in our worship this morning, um, I had the, this thought, and the, the Little Fields, we try to keep Christmas pretty simple. Uh, we do a pretty good job of that. Um, a lot of people around us will ask, are you ready for Christmas? What they mean is, have you done all your Christmas shopping, are all your decorations up, is the tree beautiful in your house? Um, and uh, one of the, the questions that, that tends to, to grab us within our families is, what do you want for Christmas? Right? You probably ask that to your kids, your spouse, your coworkers. What do you want for Christmas? Um, in, in the midst of all of this, I've had, I don't know, four or five conversations this week that are with folks who are devastated. They're devastated. Uh, they're struggling, they're, they're hurt, they're, they're hopeless, they're depressed. And they're at a point when all of these questions, are you ready for Christmas, did you get your shopping done? hit them and drives them deeper into the place that they find themselves. It's been an interesting week, and as we sang, uh, Betty Jo, great job leading us, and um, that plea from the heart, Emmanuel, will you come and will you do something and will you free us and will you heal us? We need you. And in one of those conversations this week, um, actually, another one right before the service today. Um, I find myself defaulting into, I don't know, maybe the only thing I can do is pray. And the elders and I were, were talking this week, and it was just a great conversation with them. Like, maybe that's not the place that I need to be backed up into. My wisdom isn't enough, my charisma, the words I share, they're not working, and so maybe I'll just have to pray. But maybe that ought to be the first place that I go. And what I'd like to do this morning, it's all set up. In the video that we just saw, peace on earth is the question we're asking. When we open our eyes, what do we see around us? Sometimes we see peace, but a whole lot of time we see conflict. And this week we're, we're just going to look at, I think where it's most relevant for you and I is in the relationships we have. So yeah, there's conflict across seas in the Middle East, and North Korea is a threat. And we have these international disruptions of peace. And inside a, a struggle with sin and addiction and guilt, and shame, and I have these inner conflicts that prevent me from experiencing wholeness and shalom with God. But perhaps the most common place that we lack peace is in our relationships with others. In that circle of family, within our marriages, with our kids, with our neighbors, I think that tends to be the place that we lack shalom the most. And so we're going to take a look this morning together. But as we do, I thought maybe what we could do is go to the Lord in prayer as a people. Uh, we're not a, a large church that has to stay right on schedule. And so we're going to use a little bit of our flexibility this morning. If you are one of the, those individuals that maybe this week has been really hard for you, maybe the season itself, as it's rolling in and everyone's asking about Christmas and some are pretending to get excited for Christmas, others are authentically excited. And you hear it all and you find yourself in that place wondering, does it matter? Does it mean anything? I want to invite you to go to the Prince of Peace, to seek and to ask and to receive the peace that he offers. And so we'll start in prayer and then we'll drop into our scripture together.
Father, the angels' announcements to the shepherds indeed was amazing news. It was really good news that your kingdom was bursting forward, that peace would be available to those on whom your favor rests. But God, if we're honest and if we take all the layers off, so many of us are not at peace. And we see conflict within our communities. We see racial tension. We see sexual harassment. We see individuals treating other individuals with hate rather than respect. Lord, when we look within our own circles, there's people in our lives that we've intentionally put to the side. God, you know the family members that we've chosen not to talk to for years. Lord, you know the hurt and the bitterness that we've held on to that has kept kept a relationship fractured for a long time. And you know the feelings that swirl up even when their, their name is mentioned, when our minds picture their face. And God, we come before you in faith believing that you are the Prince of Peace and that you desire to offer peace to your people. And so this morning, God, we transparently come before you saying there is brokenness in us and there is brokenness through us. And God, we ask by your Holy Spirit that you would breathe life on the dead bones around us. God, may we be a people this Advent and this Christmas that see differently and think differently, that we would be some who hold on to the hope of the world, that you are a God who redeems and reconciles and rebuilds. So we find ourselves, God, this morning in desperate need of Jesus. We are a people in desperate need of a Savior to make us whole once again. We confess our sins before you. The places our hearts have rebelled. That we've chosen ways other than your ways. God, we confess those. And in joy, we receive your forgiveness to rebuild, to renew what you've already started in our lives. God, may you make us to be a people of hope, a people of reconciliation, a people of peace in the places that are in desperate need of peace. Lord, for those here today at FCCB, that this season is a struggle, that weights and burdens and concerns seem overwhelming, oh Lord, would you breathe faith in? Would you share your peace with them that they may share it with others? God, I thank you that right now you're listening to the prayers of your people. You are king of the universe, and yet you are friend. And we are forever grateful. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You know, there's a a time in my life um, that I thought, uh, we used to drive from Nashua, where I grew up, to Rochester, uh, where my grandparents lived. Every Christmas Day, we'd make that drive, and then, in later years, as I was raising a family, we kind of did it in reverse. So I'm living in Rochester, and oftentimes we used to drive down to my parents in Nashua on Christmas Day. And I was always struck, man, it's so peaceful driving on Christmas Day. Everything is shut down, the world is at peace, it's all good. And as I got older... Um, that little bubble just burst when I began to realize, no, it's not peace. It's just vacation. It's just businesses are closed that day. There's always been inside of me something that's yearned for peace at Christmas, right? Uh, it's on our Christmas cards. Uh, it's on our decorations. It's on our banners on the wall. Peace on earth. And so... We have one up here. But what what we've done this Advent season is to take the message of the angels 
and shatter it on the bulb a little bit to disrupt us. Because peace on earth is not the magical fairy dust that oftentimes we picture, where it's Christmas, Shazam, peace. But peace on earth has a very specific price that's paid for it. And we don't just find peace because Advent and Christmas are here, but rather peace is given. So the angels tell the shepherds, peace on earth to men on whom his favor rests. And we're simply asking together some questions about peace in Christmas in the world that you and I live in. Because just a few chapter la- chapters later in Luke chapter 12, Jesus asks this very question. Oh, you thought I came to bring peace on earth? And he answers his own question. No, I didn't. But rather, division. From now on, there will be five in one family divided against each other. Three against two and two against three. There will be divided father against son and son against father. Mother against daughter and daughter against mother. Mother Mother-in-law against daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. And I think what, what Jesus is really getting at here is that peace literally is not some general idea that's simply going to flow down onto the earth. But it's concrete, and it's tangible, and some will grab hold of it, and some won't. And there will be separation between those two. And so here's, here's a couple of thoughts that we're exploring about peace on earth this Advent. First one, peace is not magic, and peace does not magically appear at Christmas. Second one, peace is given, it's not found. And it's given by King Jesus, and is made available to His kingdom people, to those on whom His favor rests. Third one, peace is not only given, Peace has to be received, which kind of leads to our fourth thought on peace. Peace always comes with a cost, a sacrifice, something that has to be given up or paid for it. I want to invite you to turn to Luke chapter 10. There's this super interesting passage, beginning in verse 1 of Luke chapter 10. We're not going to spend much time here, but I just want you to try to conceptualize what's happening. Because it's a much different take on peace. Luke chapter 10, verse 1. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. So 72 divided by 2 equals... There you go. So there's 36 teams of people traveling out to uh, Bethlehem, to Jerusalem, to Nazareth, to uh, any of the towns, to Gonic, to Rochester, to Northwood, It's simply some local towns around Jesus. There's 36 teams that go out. So he tells them, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Go. I'm sending you out like lambs among wolves. Do not take a purse or bag, or sandals, and do not greet anyone on the road. That imagery of, I'm sending you out like lambs among wolves. If you carry a message of peace today, and specifically a message of peace that can be found in the Messiah, Jesus, into our community into the raging political debates, if you carry a message of peace 
into conflicts that are going on around you. I think it's an apt analogy. Peacemakers tend to get devoured. They tend to be written off, to be ridiculed, so that the conflict can rage on because they're just naive, uninformed, uneducated. They don't understand. And so Jesus sends these 36 scenes out, says, listen, it's a a wolf pack out there. But I want you to go. You just need to know it's going to be like a lamb going into the wolf pack. And then this is what I want you to try to visualize. When you enter a house, first say, Peace, shalom, to this house. Simple enough. If a man of peace is there, your peace will rest on him. If not, it will return to you. Okay? So let's take whatever church layers that you've built up over the years... And just hear that text. If a man of peace is there, your peace will rest on him. If not, it will return to you. What do you picture? Is anything going through? I literally pictured this week as I was reading through this, a boomerang. I don't know that that's a faithful uh, textual exegetical analysis of this, but that was the first image. That if the guy catches the boomerang, he's got it. But if he doesn't catch it, it's coming back to me. And I just want you to get this sense. Peace is not some general dream. Peace is not magically appearing. I think peace, shalom, life as it should be in Jesus, is much more tangible than that. As if I can share it with you. And if you don't want it, it can be returned to me. It's a fascinating picture of peace. The tangibleness of it. You can almost touch it, feel it, uh, have a transaction with it. It's like a commodity almost. In fact, don't you know when you have peace and when you don't? If you're honest with yourself, you kind of know when you've received that peace, that shalom, you also know when you've released it, when you've let it go. Oh, maybe it's like a gift under the tree. The idea of a gift isn't sufficient. So picture those of you on Christmas morning with your kids, Um, You've got some nice boxes wrapped up, and one of your children opens up the box, and there's nothing in it. And they look at you, and you look at them, and you say, well, honey, I wanted to give you the general idea and kind of sense of um, the Hatchimal surprise and It's the idea of it that really matters, sweetie. I think at that point, any of our kids would be like, what are you talking about? There's nothing in here. And perhaps too often, guys, our concept of peace and shalom is too much like that. It's just a general sense. It's out there. It's peace on earth. And it's nothing. Until we can begin to attach something to it that's tangible and transactional that matters to us. And in Luke 10, it sure seems like it's something that can be shared and something that can be returned to us. And so today, we're just going to hear about peace to you, peace in that relational uh, moment. And there is a ton of brokenness and conflict in our world today. So many of us and so many individuals are racked with all sorts of turmoil and all sorts of inner struggles. 
And here's what makes the gospel good news. The peace of Jesus is available to be shared with someone else. To be given by followers of Jesus who have the, themselves received it. And so it's wonderful news for the broken. And it's wonderful news of healing for those who are not well. And it's wonderful news, this piece of freeing the prisoner. And for you and I, where we lack peace most probably is in our relationships. Whether it's our church, family, co-workers, neighbor, family, friends, spouses. So here's our question. What is your most difficult relationship that you have? Who is it? What's the, the picture? Wh- whose face comes on to your screen? Sharing peace in that environment requires there to be no peace or need of peace. The only way that we're peacemakers is when there's a need for peace to be made. Right? If everything's at peace, I don't need to be a peacemaker. I just get to enjoy the peace. A peacemaker comes into an environment that's lacking peace. So I wonder, who's that face? Have they betrayed you? Are they simply super annoying Has that person said hurtful things? Or maybe it's just someone who's vastly different than you and it's hard to engage. What's their name? And here's the hope from this morning. If peace truly is transactional, that I can do something with the peace that I've been given from Jesus... If peace is truly transactional, then we have a possibility. We have a possibility to do something we couldn't have done otherwise. And Jesus picks up on this in Matthew 5. Uh, I had Madeline read a version of the Beatitudes that N.T. Wright wrote. And I don't know if you caught the change in that feel. Normally we hear, blessed are the poor in spirit. And so we take the stance, oh man, I want to be blessed. I better be poor in spirit. Like these are character traits in which to attain. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Oh man, I guess I need to to mourn. And all of a sudden you start thinking, "I, I don't know that Jesus is saying, Be like these people in order to get a blessing. And I think N.T. Wright picks up the intention of Jesus is speaking to people who are poor in spirit, speaking to people who are peacemakers, speaking to people who tend to show mercy, saying, hey guys, I've got some wonderful news. The kingdom is breaking in. And those things your heart has longed for, I'm going to be sharing them with you. In fact, these are the traits of the people he speaks to. The poor in spirit, the mourners, the meek. People who hunger and thirst for God's justice. The merciful, the pure in heart. And finally, the peacemakers. Wonderful news for the peacemakers. Some of you have that nature, and God has given it to you, that you are a peacemaker. That when conflict erupts, you're not a conflict avoider. That is a different set of people. But you are someone that says, I'm going to put my foot in. I'm going to enter this conflict. I'm not going to avoid it. But I want to see peace come out, and I want to be that voice of peace. And you've gotten run over a lot of times for doing that. There are some people who are peacemakers because God has made them peacemakers and they pray for peace. And I want you to hear Jesus' words over those folk. 
over you. Wonderful news for the peacemakers. You will be called God's children. God's children. Peacemakers? You who look to create peace and give peace? You look like your dad. You'll be called children of God because, boy, you remind me of your dad. You know, one of the greatest compliments I think I've gotten in my life is whether it's my wife or other people, someone will pick up on some trait about my son, Ethan, and I'll just hear the comment, wow, Ethan, you're a lot like your dad. Literally, I hear that and my heart leaps like, I'm so proud of that. I love that. I mean, not all of it is good, right? (laughs) But nonetheless, I love it. I love hearing people see my reflection in my son because I'm proud of him. And when people see my reflection, my heart leaps. And it is no different with your Heavenly Father. Peacemakers, you will be called children of God because you look and act and remind us of our Heavenly Father. Children of God. So there's wonderful news for agents of peace out there. Because don't you need wonderful news? So I'll just tell you. You can disagree with this, but I think... I'm not good at self-analysis, ever. But here's one thing that I do think. I think God has given me the heart for peacemaking. I'm not always effective. I bumble around. But I think my heart is there. This is one of the Beatitudes my heart kind of rejoices on because I'm like, yes, I feel that. I need wonderful news. And if you're anything like me, I look at the world around me. I look at the people around me. I look at the relationships. I look at the headlines. Good Lord, do we need peacemakers among us. And peacemakers are, we get devastated when marriages collapse around us. Peacemakers, we get really intensely sorrowful when racial things explode and all of a sudden two different people won't speak to each other. And peacemakers need some wonderful news. Because we don't always get to see peace here on earth. Jesus says, you will be called God's children. Those who look for ways to share peace, rather than engage in heightened conflict, you act as children of the kingdom. And the great news is that Jesus has made peace possible. The birth of this baby in Bethlehem, the announcements of the shepherds to them, means that peace is now possible through Jesus with others. And I want to get really specific here with you. Because peace is not general. It's not the magic fairy dust. And these people are not some nameless, faceless people. That person... That went through your mind. That you are not talking to. That you've cut off a relationship with. That person that is so different than you. That person who has hurt you. That person you said you never want to see again. Jesus has made peace possible even with them. Even with them. Because peace with God is possible. Because of Jesus and His death on a cross, you and I get to have peace with God. And it's available to the whole world who come in faith to the cross to say, yes, Jesus has paid my penalty. The uh, church word for it is atonement. That Jesus has borne the cost that you and I could never bear. 
for our rebellion against God and our sin against God. And in that death and through my faith connecting into the cross, all of my sin, all of my rebellion, all of my bad choices, all of my bad memories, all of it is lumped on the cross and paid for completely, totally forever. And in that moment, I have peace with my Creator. I have peace with God. And Jesus' death has made that possible for everyone. And because of that, because I can have peace with God, I can choose to experience shalom with others. And here's the cost. Peace is never free. The cost to have peace with others is we lay our own selfish desires and what we're owed aside. Let me put it this way. Whatever has fractured your relationship with others, whatever has come between you and this other person, you're probably owed something. It's probably legitimate. They probably sinned against you. They probably owe something to make up that relationship that they're refusing to give you whether it's an apology or whether they stole money from you or whatever it might be, it is likely a legitimate barrier between you and the other person. And the beauty of peace is that as you've experienced God's forgiveness, you have the opportunity to say, yes, that's legitimate, that hurt, that was sin. That was not okay. But I choose to forgive you as God has forgiven me. You don't owe me a thing. Because Jesus has loved me on the cross, I want to show you what that looks like. And I want to share this peace, this forgiveness with you. I'm not going to hold it against you anymore. I love you. Because Jesus has loved me. The price is you don't have to justify yourself or be vindicated. You don't have to pursue your own uh, agenda. Because you get to die to yourself to live for Jesus. Because he's a new master, new dad, a new king. Who looks a lot like peace. As a prince of peace. What Jesus has done for you already, you already are justified, guys. You already are vindicated. You don't have to prove it to anybody. And in that moment, you can't add or take away from what Jesus has done for you. It's a done deal. So wonderful news to the peacemakers. If peace has come to you, In Jesus, you can offer it to others when they don't deserve it. When you think you deserve something more from them. When you've been wronged. When the mention of their name makes the hair on your neck stand up. And you want to get even or check out. Wonderful news for the peacemakers. You will be called children of God. Because we have a Savior on a cross who laid his life down to bring peace and giving us an example to follow. I want to make mention of something we're doing this Advent. Um, Just out of curiosity, how many of you uh, went to the Advent making calendar or Advent calendar making? Um, So, full disclosure... Um, it has been really hard for the Littlefields to get on this daily. It, it's a lot daily to do this. And so I want to free you up if you're finding the same thing like, ah, oh, no, yesterday is stacked up and here's today. The intention is not to load you up with all sorts of, oh, no, we're failing. The intention is simple. Could there be a training of our hearts and minds in very simple ways to be agents of peace through purposeful acts of kindness. 
And so the little fields, we tend to about, we look at it every day, but we tend to be every other day we're grabbing hold and we're able to do one of them. And the intention is, can I see others differently than I see them now? By thanking the clerk tangibly, can I offer kindness and peace? By baking cookies for the fire department in town and bringing them and giving them to a stranger and feeling a really weird moment, can I build in my heart something in simple areas that can help me transcend in the really hard areas? That I might bring Jesus' peace to others in the places that it's really challenging and really difficult. Peace comes with a cost, letting go of what is owed you in order to be like your dad. And here's where I want to close us. This means your screw-ups, your failures, your experiences, your sufferings, all of them can be turned around to be a blessing for others. So if you could turn with me, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. You know that old commercial, uh, What Would You Do for Klondike Bar? It's one of those ditties that, like, it never quite leaves you. It, it just Im- imprinted on me. I don't know uh, what your most difficult memory is, whether it's relational or whether it's a choice you made or a sin or something you're carrying guilt or maybe it's something this week. I don't know what it is for you. But whatever your most difficult memory is, what would you give to change it? I'd give a lot, guys. Probably most of us would. And here's a little more gospel for peacemakers. Whatever that decision was, whatever that sin, memory, whatever it is, in the good news of Jesus, Jesus takes it and redeems it out of its darkness into light to say, now you can go and be a blessing to others who chose an abortion. Good news for you. Now you can go and be with others who chose to cheat on the IRS and are devastated. Now you can go and share with others the good news of Jesus right in your marriage. Because you know what it's like to be cheated on. You can share what Jesus does for others who are suffering. You can be an agent of peace in the dark alleys that you used to roam that Jesus plucked you out of. You can be an agent of peace and those experiences and sufferings and sin can be redeemed by your Lord. And that's what Paul is getting at in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning in 14. For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And He died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for Him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Can I just say that's not talking about you? That's not talking about you. That's talking about the person you're thinking of. That's talking about anyone in Christ is a new creation and we're not going to look at them the same way anymore. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us 
the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to Himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. And He has committed to us the message of reconciliation. That Jesus has done these amazing things. The Gospel is big enough to handle your failures. The Gospel is good enough to restore you from your darkness. The Gospel is big enough to take you from the kingdom of darkness and place you into the kingdom of the Son He loves. The Gospel is big enough to handle any of your memories, any of your sins. And God commits to us this message in verse 20. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making His appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made Him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. We get to be ambassadors of reconciliation, or be fair to say ambassadors of peace in the world around us. And the God of heaven chooses to use people like you and people like me to appeal to others around us that God is good and Jesus forgives and the gospel is real. And we get to live as ambassadors of that message for others. How you and I react to situations, how we choose to handle difficult moments, I think that's what peace is all about. It's in the specific moment. What will I say? What will I do? How will I proceed? How will I pray? The situations you have in mind, I want to release you. Be an agent of peace. Bring the transaction of peace and They may not receive it. It may come back to you. But they just might. They just might see in that moment something about what Jesus works in the hearts of men and in the hearts of women. With your kids, your spouse, whoever that is you're thinking of. In spite of the reasons you're thinking, not them. Pastor, you don't... I don't know. But I do know the gospel is big enough. And God has chosen you to be his ambassador of peace in that situation with that person. Because you get to represent your dad to him. You get to be the picture of your dad right in the conflicts of your life. And Jesus has made it possible to be that peacemaker that our relationships so desperately need. I've asked the question. I just want to drop it out this morning. I've asked myself the question. God, I've seen within your church, sometimes there's not peace. Right? Within whether it's FCCB or Journey or Be Free or any of God's churches anywhere, there can be conflict. And how... Can the God of peace make His appeal through His church that also can experience conflict and turmoil? How can that be, God? We ought to be a place where peace is readily available. And uh, I'll close with this. I think one of the reasons God chooses to use you as His ambassador of reconciliation into those spaces and why He uses the church to do the same thing is because you're not perfectly at peace. It's because you have stories around you. It's because you have a layer of guilt. Because the church is broken and not perfect yet. That it's not about you. And it's not about the church. It's about our Savior in heaven that restores. And as broken vessels who have been patched together in peace, offer peace, They don't see us. And they ought not just see the church. 
but rather our Father in heaven, who is at work reconciling the world to himself. May you, by God's Spirit, find the courage, find the grace, find the power and strength to be God's agent of peace this Advent. Let me pray. Father, the the work that you've done in our lives is amazing. And God, your heart for the world is eternally full. And Lord, we thank you for the ways that you've been able to use us to bring peace around us. And in those spaces, whether it's a conversation in our community or in our nation, or whether it's specifically in a relationship we have, God, we ask that you'd give us a heart of a peacemaker to offer forgiveness where forgiveness is needed. To speak about a God who reconciles and a God who recreates when that news is needed. But at all times, Father, in all spaces, may you give us eyes and may you give us faith to be able to offer peace where peace is needed. All for the glory of your name and the glory of your Son, Lord. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen.